It's only the second instalment of my new series, Guide Rail. Go and watch the first one. And I'm already breaking the theme by talking about a ship. Guide Boy, how's that? Today we're looking at the Titanic exhibition, which as of writing is currently on tour in London until spring 2022. But for the sake of anyone wishing to visit before then, here's what you can expect. Owned by Spanish museum group Musealia, Muse, Musealia. Owned by Spanish museum group Musealia, the uh, the exhibition showcases artifacts from a range of sources that have already toured Germany, Denmark, Ukraine, Spain, Sweden, and even Mexico. We visit in Dock X in Canada Water, London, a two-minute walk from the tube station. I'll save you the story of the Titanic, as I'm sure you will know it. Artifacts on display include items belonging to passengers, those who survived and those who did not, replicas of rooms to various degrees of accuracy, furniture from sister ship Olympic and other white starline vessels, as well as models and one or two pieces from the wreck. After going through three different check-in areas, we ignored the £2 cloakroom fee and turned the corner where my suspicions immediately rose. Not that one. You're greeted by a photographer with a very basic mock-up of the hull, as if you're stepping aboard. And already I was worried that this was going to be an exploitive, cheap cash grab attraction. But let's not judge a ship by its ability to float. There's a free audio guide, and you can listen to it yourself in the description. As Covid is still drifting about, it's advised that you bring your own headphones and download the guide on your phone. But you can borrow a headset if you need to. The whole tour is accompanied by James Horner's soundtrack from the movie, which, as incredible as it is, I love it a bit, again it made me worry that the real tragedy wasn't going to be given justice. We spent two hours wandering around the five large rooms, which most of the time were very quiet and felt like an art gallery. It's very dark, but generally items are well lit and easy to see if you're able to get close to the glass cases. The first room is dedicated to the construction of the Titanic, and onwards to the launching, life on board, the sinking and the aftermath. Paper documents like passenger lists and postcards from the Olympic class will probably appeal more to real ocean liner fans, whilst the more tangible items like a mock-up watertight door will be more fascinating to the general tourist. Considering these replicas, I didn't feel like real pieces like this window from RMS Olympic got the attention it deserved. Where people were crowding around was this huge model, which was cut away on one side to show the interior. It's absolutely beautiful and shows each room in context to each other. On the website, there's a photo of what some may think is a life-size recreation of the famous forward grand staircase like at Pigeon Forge for instance, but let's not be fooled by mirages on the horizon, because it's actually just a 2D wall print. Tucked away at the side is another overlooked piece, a fragment from the actual staircase that was kept by a crew member following the disaster. Considering the wood on the wreck has completely rotted away, to have any part of this room still around is remarkable. A popular display was this necklace owned by passenger Kate Phillips, which was the inspiration for the Heart of the Ocean in James Cameron's movie, the one Rose feeds to the dolphins. This was based on a true story of a couple who were running away to America together, including a key to a chest, now never to be opened, on the bottom of the Atlantic. Other heartbreaking items include wedding rings, diaries and similar belongings to those who perished, all the more poignant when displayed next to a photo of the same item over a hundred years ago. Items of clothing also give a very human touch to the exhibit, such as these shoes worn by young survivor Louise Kink. One thing this exhibit does very well is telling the stories of some lesser-known passengers, in addition to the key figures. 
instead of focusing just on the captain, for instance, there's a reasonable discussion around First Officer Murdoch and his often unfair portrayal during the sinking. Many Titanic museums have recreated spaces to show the contrast between travel in 1912 and today. Usually these will include a third-class cabin because these are small and simple rooms to reconstruct. This exhibit does the same, as well as small imitations of two first-class cabins. There's also a representation of the Marconi wireless room, which was fascinating despite its inaccuracies due to space limitations. Something that I hadn't experienced elsewhere in the UK is a recreated B-deck corridor, which takes you from one room to another. Although some may see it just as a corridor, this felt like a really experience-efficient way of showing visitors what is still a very recognisable interior space. The boat equivalent of this kid will instantly deny this by pointing out that there wasn't blue carpet or rugs on the original, and I'd have to agree that a revised version would certainly help to sell the experience. But credit where it's due, if you get a moment where no other visitors are walking past, it does feel very immersive, and it's something I hope more museums do accurately in future. Then the moment is spoiled when you watch this sinking animation that looks like a cutscene from Lego Island 2. Another interactive exhibit is this imitation iceberg with horror movie hand marks on it, which you get to touch to see how cold it is. Yes, you could go to your freezer and touch a block of ice for yourself, but I think this one is here to give you context and remind you just how cold the water would have been on that fateful night. With only a piece of coal from the wreck and a fragment of the staircase from Titanic itself, many relics are instead from Olympic, accompanied by photos of how they were on board. Light fixtures, a wall panel and a wash basin were sadly overlooked by a lot of people wandering around. There was a small sign noting what you were looking at, but the audio guide flew past these pretty quickly. What I do appreciate is that they were viewable from 360 degrees, so you can see notes written by carpenters before they were fitted to the ship, using the ship's construction number rather than name. There was also a model of a prototype stackable lifeboat, and in the last room, further models of the wreck. The tour ends, as many museums do, with a list of names from all of those who perished that night, where you may find your own family name, and almost certainly someone who was your age. So, overall thoughts. As a temporary travelling exhibit, don't be tricked into thinking this means there's only a handful of items to look at. Each display case is full of items of varying significance in telling Titanic's story, but more importantly, of her passengers and crew. The whole experience is made very personal to those on board, rather than simply glorifying the ship itself and there are a handful of sections that may be considered upsetting for young children. Due to the backgrounds of contributors to the exhibition, many items are from Swedish passengers and beyond, which help to represent how this was a global tragedy that had widespread impacts to families across the world. This isn't to say that the exhibition doesn't lean back on more basic portrayals of the ship. The hosts know that most visitors will only know of Titanic through the movie, so easily recognisable pieces, such as a fake iceberg, are there to cater for them. The same must go for the add-ons on offer. Standard adult entry varies depending on when you go, but at minimum is £19.50. For £10 more, you get VIP access, which is fast track entry, though you really don't need it, free use of the cloakroom, just hold your coats, a photo and a booklet. At £10 per photo, this might be a good deal for some, but personally I'd say the standard or concession price is decent enough. There are entry slots from 9am all the way to 8.30pm, so if you can avoid peak times then you may as well, but bear in mind that you need about an hour and a half to walk around. As I say, there doesn't seem to be a clear date for when this exhibition ends in London, but no doubt it'll be travelling to other countries soon. It's certainly worth it for those interested in the ship who know what they're looking at, or those who are sitting on the fence between liking the movie and wanting to know more about the true story of those on board. Speaking of which, thank you for boarding this instalment of Guide Rail, or Guide Boy, or whatever this is. 
Tune in next month where we get back on the rails, ha 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 ha, and look at somewhere else you can visit. First off, the ceiling was not blue. Are you lucky to see your riding? Thank you to all of my brilliant patrons, Alex Goodman, GB H Train, Donald Nine and Douglas Ten, D0280 Falcon, Sean Tempest, Kildane's Coven, Nat, Sam Bennett, Alco, and Henry Forrester.